Good evening, everyone. My name is Dean Sarinilio. I teach in the Department of Social and Cultural Analysis. And I am very honored to be able to introduce all of you to Professor Stephen Salaita. Professor Stephen Salaita is a scholar at the forefront of thinking through global indigenous studies and comparative settler colonialism. He has written six books, one of which is the groundbreaking The Holy Land in Transit, Colonialism and the Quest for Canaan. Stephen was an associate professor of English at Virginia Tech before accepting a tenured faculty position at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign's program in American Indian Studies, which had been pushing the field of indigenous studies through their careful and deliberate hires to contend with global indigenous studies. And so many of us in indigenous studies were excited that some of the best scholars examining Native North American, Pacific Islander, and now Arab American and the Middle East were all going to be working together at UI, UI, uh, UC. Instead, as you all know, uh, Stephen was wrongfully terminated just before the semester started, which immediately sparked an international boycott of UIUC, which quickly drew And it quickly grew to include more than 5,000 academics. So in this, I mean the often quoted phrase that war is politics by other means, and the inverse that is also true that many of us cite, that politics is war by other means. And the continuation of war means the political control of the representation of this war, the silencing of its critics. I see the firing of Stephen Salaita as a part of a politics that attempts to silence us from speaking in opposition to a war machine. This is a historic fight, and Stephen Salaita's voice is one that we cannot afford to lose in our current global movement for decolonization and deoccupation. Malcolm X has said that through, quote, skillful manipulation of the press, they make the victim look like the oppressor and the oppressor look like the victim. If you're not careful, the newspapers will have you hating the people who are being oppressed and loving the people who are doing the oppressing. We are all very fortunate to have Stephen with us tonight. And like you, I am excited to hear Stephen speak. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Stephen Salaita. Thank Dean for his uh, flattering um, introduction. Um, and of course, to the sponsoring um, um, departments. Okay, and, uh, thank you to everybody. Okay, I'm going to um, Well, before I get started, a, a qualification. Um, I'm well aware that the Israel Palestine conflict is controversial. Believe me, I'm. Well aware, I, you know, well, uh, extremely aware. Um, I, have, I, have, I have strong views about the conflict, but feel confident that my perspectives are grounded in a preponderance of evidence. Even if we agree on evidence, though, and I'm sure we don't, there are dozens, maybe hundreds, of moral options available to us in the arenas of interpretation and action. I didn't come to argue or provoke, but to discuss. So I welcome your reactions and questions, and I'll, I'll do my best to answer them as honestly as possible. With the term internationalism, with the, the backslash between inter and nationalism, I emphasize communalism and dialogue across borders, both natural and geopolitical, not the nationalism of the nation state, but of the nation itself as composed of heterogeneous communities functioning as self-identified collectives attached to particular land bases. Internationalism is a way to compare nationalisms, to put them into conversation, but also to examine how the invention and evolution of national identities necessarily rely on an international dialectics. Internationalism encourages and assesses the play of decolonial narratives across cultures and colonial borders. I divide the term with the slash to reflect not just the political, philosophical, 
and ethical dialogue intimated by the prefix inter, but also to separate nationalism from the prefix while keeping the two halves connected in such a way that they create more possibilities in juxtaposition. Internationalism expresses a desire for scholarship to explore broader patterns of discourse and power in our analyses of specific communities and a commitment to the project of nation building through deep engagement with decolonial paradigms. I want to talk about Palestine as it relates to notions of indigeneity in North America. In order to do this, it's useful to think about the place of Palestine in the American imagination. I mean three things by imagination, though the term lends itself to infinite possibilities. One, how Palestine has been imagined in American discourses since the early days of European settlement. That is to say, how it has been invented as a mythological space based largely on the desires of the American polity. Two, how Palestine in its biblical incarnations provided early settlers an ideal of nationhood that continues to influence American identity and even its foreign policy. And three, how Palestine has been constructed by American politicians and commentators as a site of intractable struggle, a symbol of a particular sort of pre-modernity that creates anxiety around the inability of the American ideal to fully come to fruition. I would argue that Palestine has been as crucial to the making of America, itself a contested and inconsistent space, as any other landscape, including those in Africa that provided slave labor and the nostalgic reconstruction of the mother countries, England, Germany, Italy, Ireland, and so forth. In other words, although the United States has been embroiled in Palestine only recently, within the past hundred years, Palestine is a myth and an avatar informs the groundwork of the American project. Palestine is the progenitor of Manifest Destiny. Here's a passage from Puritan firebrand Cotton Mather speaking in the early 18th century. Turn not your back till they are consumed. Wound them that they shall not be able to arise. And for a close, let me remind you that while you fight, we'll pray. We will keep the mount with our hands lifted up while you are in the field with your lives in your hands against the Amalek that is now annoying this Israel in the wilderness. The pronoun they refers to the native tribes Mather wanted exterminated, as was the indigenous population of the Holy Land on orders from God as recorded in the Old Testament's book of Joshua. Amalek, of course, is a reference to the land of Canaan and its environs, occupied by numerous tribes. So Mather, like other Puritans, superimposes a biblical narrative onto the American landscape. The settlers are Israel in the wilderness. The natives are godless souls, Canaanites, Amalekites, Jebusites, Hittites, and others who must be removed or slaughtered in order for a godly vision to prevail. In one sense, Mather's discourse is an allegory. In a very real way, though, he was being literal in describing his circumstances as a New World settler. Mather, by the way, firm, famously referred to natives as the, the accursed seed of Canaan. Mather wasn't an outlier. His narrative of American settlement as a holy enterprise reflects a discourse with variations used for centuries in the process of New World conquest, even among the secular. Indians inhabited Amalek. Settlers were to tame the wilderness and create a godly kingdom of milk and honey. What does this have to do with modern Palestine? A lots, actually. Palestinians are conceptualized in significant American demographics as a modern Amalek, preventing the establishment or reestablishment of a modern holy state. Scholars generally call this type of viewpoint messianism. The United States has long been a deeply messianic nation. 
This messianism isn't limited to practices of settlement, nor does it adhere to tidy liberal conservative binaries. Martin Luther King Jr., for instance, used messianic discourses in his speeches and essays. So did George W. Bush. Look also at the number of towns in the United States named Canaan or New Canaan. There are tons. There are also lots of Bethlehems and Hebrons and Palestines. The one in, in Texas is pronounced Palestine. You know, that's my, that's my favorite of, of the Palestines. Um, there, are also, there are also countless place names derived from native languages. So the interactions of biblical narrative and native peoplehood are, are legion. Let, let's, let's better get at this point. The Exodus narrative on which so many versions of colonial salvation and liberation theology are based is, is a terrific model of freedom from oppression. I mean, think about it. An ethnic minority population is enslaved in a foreign land. It relies on its wit, morality, perseverance, courage, and most of all, godly assistance to escape to a promised land of excess and independence. It wasn't such a terrific model to the tribes already in the Holy Land, however. They were slaughtered at the behest of God. That is to say, they were victims of another group's liberation. A famous essay by Robert Warrior, who you should go see next semester, um, makes this point. Called Canaanites, Cowboys, and Indians, a Native American perspective, in it, Warrior observes, the Exodus narrative tells us that the Canaanites have status only as the people Yahweh removes from the land in order to bring the chosen people in. They are not to be trusted, nor are they to be allowed to enter into social relationships with the people of Israel. They are wicked, and their religion is to be avoided at all costs. The laws put forth regarding strangers and sojourners may have stopped the people of Yahweh, from wanton oppression, but presumably only after the land was safely in the hands of Israel. The covenant of Yahweh depends on this. For this reason, comparison of natives and Palestinians has flourished in recent years. Both groups occupy the unfortunate position of unchosen in narratives of godly conquest. The Holy Land accompanied American colonization. The U.S. has returned the favor in its support of Israel. The centrality of messianism and manifest destiny to American national identity ensures that many Americans will identify with Israel seemingly on impulse, though impulses are never as neutral or natural as they pretend to be. To identify with Israel is in many ways to accept the mythologies of American conquest. Let me talk a little about modern Palestine, because like with most aspects of history, it's difficult, if not impossible, to understand the past without making sense of the present. Here are some basic facts about the Israel-Palestine conflict. Israel currently occupies the Palestinian West Bank and Syrian Golan Heights in contravention of international law. It exerts full control over the Gaza Strip, at various points in its history, it occupied the Egyptian Sinai Peninsula and southern Lebanon. Some say it still does, and I'd also point out that it continues to occupy 1948 Palestine. West Bank Palestinians are subject to a set of discriminatory laws. Palestinian citizens of Israel are also subject to a set of discriminatory laws. Israel's military occupation is illegal according to international law and various human rights conventions. Israel displaced around 700,000 Palestinians during the period of its founding, 1947 to 1949. Israel killed over 500 children during Operation Protective Edge, its recent attack on Gaza. Israel considers itself a state for all Jews anywhere in the world, rather than one for all of its actual citizens. Israel is the sole nuclear power in the Middle East. Israel received three billion in annual aid from, receives three billion in annual aid from the United States, not including weapons shipments and loan guarantees. There is unassailable documentary 
evidence that from the earliest days of Zionism, its leaders intended to cleanse the native Arab population from Palestine. Now, I selected these facts from a Rolodex of possibilities. Anybody can pick and choose issues to supplement or create a particular story. So facts are never indicators of truth in and of themselves. From the Palestinian point of view, though, these issues are crucial. They comprise the historical circumstances by which Palestinians have been dispossessed. I also highlight them as a counterpoint to modern Palestine in the American imagination. As in the past, Palestine is a symbol. For many, it is an avatar of barbaric Arab and Muslim violence, a key battleground in the global war on terror. For others, it is a space of courageous resistance. On the political left especially, Palestine has become a metaphor of liberatory struggle, the site of a new third world movement against Western imperialism. For others still, it is a confounding example of tribal or religious intractability. Palestine exists along or creates numerous fault lines in American political discourse. In many ways, Israel is a fuller realization of the American dream. Palestine, on the other hand, is an anxiety, one whose existence ensures the presence of the native. It is also a geography where myth and matter converge. To put it simply, even though there are clearly geopolitical implications in Israel and Palestine for the United States, Americans are engaged in the so-called Holy Land for reasons that go far beyond geopolitics. In turn, arguments about the Israel-Palestine conflict can be messy. I consider myself kind of sort of young, but um, I'm already a, a veteran of, of those arguments. And I'm aware that people feel deeply invested. They feel invested because the conflict is a matter of identity just as much as it is of geography and economics. Yet, I'd like to propose that Israel-Palestine is no more intense or unusual than any other violent conflict over land. We confer to it an exceptional status, but when we remove the mythology, which admittedly is hard to do, it's just another case of settler colonization, not terribly unlike what happened in North America, Algeria, South Africa, New Zealand, and Australia. The conflict is easily understood and has a straightforward solution. It began because one group of people forcibly settled the land of another group of people. Its solution is to stop the colonization and implement a system of democracy for all citizens rather than a tiered system of access and belonging based on religious background. A solution is complex or impossible only for those invested in the illegal occupation of Palestine and the structural iniquities it produces. It's also so complex and impossible because in the United States, settlement is seen as normative, inevitable, and irreversible. I can't count the times I've heard some variation of, of the following argument. Look, the dispossession of Palestinians, they even say it like that. Look, you know, the, the dispossession of Palestinians happened, and as tragic as it was, we're all better off because of it. Look at the United States. It had to displace Indians to create the world's greatest democracy. Trademark, you know, you have to put the trademark around world's greatest democracy, right? Uh, you know, so should the United States return stolen land to the Indians? You've all heard that argument, right? You hear that argument all the time. Well, it's an inadequate argument, right, for historical and moral reasons. The idea behind it is that you can't reverse history. But such a notion can only be put forward by the victor, who, after all, spent plenty of time reversing history in order to accrue his power. In fact, I would suggest that this isn't an argument. It's an evasion. Leaving that aside, the most important thing about this logic is what it tells us about ourselves, what it says about our acceptance, 
if only unconsciously, of profound violence in the service of democracy. The question, should the United States return stolen land to the Indians, is rhetorical, of course. The answer is embedded in the question. Of course not. Don't be absurd. And the correlation is that it would be absurd for Israel to do the same to Palestinians. It's a type of mutual delegitimization of native populations. But the question can't function in isolation. It relies on a sweep of history that illuminates how crucial the mythologies of Palestine are to the American imagination. Israeli historian Benny Morris puts it this way. To be extremely clear, I'm quoting, because I never, ever, ever want my words confused with Benny Morris's. Um, hey, uh, even the great American democracy couldn't come to be without the forced extinction of Native Americans. There are times the overall final good justifies terrible, cruel deeds. But his reasoning um, suggests a, a finality to the past, an affirmation of tragedy trapped in the immutability of linear time. Its logic is terribly cliche, a peculiar form of common sense always taken up everywhere by the beneficiaries of colonial power. The problems with invoking native genocide to rationalize Palestinian dispossession are extraordinary. The most noteworthy problem speaks to the unresolved detritus of American history. Natives aren't objects of the past. They are living communities whose numbers are growing. It's rarely a good idea to ask rhetorical questions that have literal answers. Yes. The United States absolutely should return stolen land to the Indians. That's precisely what its treaty obligations require it to do. <laughs> the United States is a settler nation, but its history hasn't been settled. Yet most people invoke natives as if they lost a contest that entrapped them in the past. And this only if natives are considered at all. As a result, most analyses of both domestic and foreign policies are inadequate, lacking a necessary context of continued colonization and resistance. For natives, political aspirations aren't focused on accessing the mythologies of a multicultural America, but on the practices of sovereignty and self-determination, consecrated in treaty agreements, and of course, in their own histories. Treaties aren't guidelines or suggestions, they are nation-to-nation -nation agreements whose stipulations exist in perpetuity. That the federal government still ignores so many of those agreements indicates that colonization isn't simply an American memory. One of the most famous violations is the Treaty of Fort Laramie of 1851 and 1868, which guaranteed the Lakota possession of the Black Hills. The American government seized the Black Hills nine years after signing the treaty in 1877, having discovered sizable deposits of gold and other precious minerals. In 1980, the US Supreme Court ruled that the federal government had unjustly appropriated the Black Hills, and by appropriated, they really mean stole. The court awarded the Lakota 15.5 million now well over 100 million with inflation for the adjusted value of the appropriated land, but the tribe has consistently refused the monetary settlement, preferring instead to retain entitlement to its historical territory, and holy territory, I should add. So to clarify, vast portions of five US states, North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska, Wyoming, and Montana, are Indian land according to a treaty to which the American government voluntarily assented. The highest legal authority in the United States has acknowledged that a significant portion of the land in question is rightfully Lakota. The American government refuses to return the land. 
a comparable example of continuing U.S. colonization, and unfortunately, this could go on for a while, right? We 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 could be here at the same time tomorrow, sort of uh, 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 listing the ways that 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 the U.S. government has engaged in some sort of mendacity vis-a-vis -vis, um, indigenous communities. But uh, it's it, it, the a com comparable example exists in Hawaii, the youngest American state. Hawaii became an American possession in 1893 due to a coup d'etat led by colonist Sanford Dole, cousin of James Dole, who not so coincidentally made a fortune growing produce on the islands. President Grover Cleveland commissioned an investigation into the overthrow of the Hawaiian monarchy led by Con Con uh, Georgia Congressman James Henderson Blunt. The Blunt Report condemned the annexation the condemnation ultimately did no good. American businessmen and politicians saw too much value in the new property to constrain their avarice. To this day, the Kanaka Maoli, or the native Hawaiians, do not recognize the legitimacy of the annexation and consider themselves subjects of foreign rule. While American tourists enjoy hula dances and Mai Tais on stolen land, the Kanaka Maoli Victims of a conquest that in no way has passed continue to organize for liberation. Colonialism is present across North America in less obvious ways, though the lack of obviousness doesn't mitigate its relevance. Corporate malfeasance is especially harmful to indigenous communities in the Americas and across the world. Native nations have dealt with an uninterrupted expropriation of resources for over a century and now experience an inordinate amount of disease and pollution. At present, natives and their allies in both Canada and the US are working to stop the Keystone XL pipeline, a project that portends environmental damage and serious health concerns. Natives have encountered violence in attempting to exercise their hunting and fishing rights. Police brutality is acute in Indian country. Natives, women especially, are murdered at an epidemic rate with the majority of cases unresolved. And many communities are still waiting on various institutions to comply with federal legislation requiring the return of artifacts and human remains to their rightful owners. Nor should we forget that the forced sterilization of native women and the kidnapping of children to be educated, that is, brutally assimilated, in government boarding schools where many were sexually molested and subject to countless other abuses were still happening within the past half century. And here I'll take a, a moment to, to, to highlight the fact that uh, Israel was caught recently red-handed, uh, forcibly ster uh, sterilizing um, African women. The inveterate omission of these realities in analyses of American politics constitutes an erasure of indigenous histories and, il and illuminates why it is so easy to conceptualize the United States as historically settled. If we recall the existence of dynamic Indian nations, though, we have no choice but to rethink the commonplaces of American virtue. It is a foolish conceit to suggest that history has ended in the United States. No amount of ignorance, willful or unwilling, will invalidate the vigorous efforts to decolonize the North and South American continents. When Israel's supporters invoke the dispossession of living communities on those continents as a rationale for colonizing Palestine, they betray a profound disdain of indigenous humanity, the sort of contempt that renders the oppressor's psyche so unsettled. They also illustrate that far from being the dialogical opposite of third world barbarism, modernity itself is impossible without violent practices justified as inevitable. I mentioned earlier that plenty of moral options are available to us in exploring the Israel-Palestine conflict. It's, it's absolutely true, and I imagine that during the Q&A we'll have an opportunity to hear some of those moral options. I have only two things to say in advance of, of this conversation. One, 
limiting Israel-Palestine to religious acrimony or to the code words of terrorism and democracy misses the point badly. Whatever our viewpoint, we should treat the conflict as familiar and unexceptional, as something that doesn't demystify reality, but informs it. And two, I urge us to extract Palestine from the American imagination and think about it in the context of its own lived experience instead. Finally, allow me to, uh, to take a moment uh, to explore the question of, of academic freedom in, in the context of what I've been saying. I know that, that that's, that's on a lot of people's minds. I think everything I've discussed contextualizes my situation with, with the University of Illinois. More than mere context, I would say that everything I've discussed has come to a head with my firing from UIUC, an event that's become a flashpoint for numerous issues and frustration. I was hired to teach in the American Indian Studies program, a crucial fact that too often is overlooked. It's crucial because my termination isn't simply a personal problem, but an attack on the fields of American Indian and indigenous studies and the humanities and social sciences more broadly. That university administrators deployed the language of civility to justify their actions illuminates a model of governance deeply rooted in colonial ethos. Civility exists in the lexicon of conquest. It is the language of Cotton Mather's diatribes. It is the discourse of educated racism. It is the sanctimony of the authoritarian. It is the pretext of the oppressor. It tells us that American Indian studies and indigenous scholars require special oversight, one that contravenes the legal and historical conventions of university governance. It is a tragic allegory of a centuries-old federal Indian policy, or perhaps a meta-narrative more than an allegory. The profound delegi delegitimization of American Indian studies at Illinois cannot be underestimated. To support Palestine in the American polity automatically entails an act of radicalism, no matter how measured or demonstrable the point of view. It is necessarily uncivil, no matter how polite the appeal. To raise this support in context of native peoples is doubly threatening and requires a special administrative dispensation. It recalls periods of American history that supposedly have ended, that have no place in the modern consciousness. It would be a great mistake to conceptualize my termination as having much to do with me beyond the unpredictability of chance. I and the university at this point are merely protagonists in a broader contest about how our universities will function in the future. They can continue to be neoliberal corporations, or they can reclaim their status as sites of actual education. We're all in, entrapped by the history of civility as a rationale for violence and a rhetorical device to neatly separate the modern from the savage. Throughout this history, academic freedom has never been a panacea. African Americans have never fully received its protections. In too many instances, they have been antagonized or brutalized by the pieties of objectivity. The same is true of indigenous peoples or of any deviant body or body of deviant ideas. Adjunct faculty have no functional academic freedom. Upper administrators aren't simply swelling the ranks of the contingent to save money. They desire a workforce that can be expendable and easily punished if that's what the political winds demand. Of course this is all about civility. Civility is not a state of mind. It is a regime. Civility reinforces the conceits of modernity. Academic freedom is a function of modernity. It will therefore always have difficulty accommodating systematic critique of state power. No state attaches more power to the stature of its identity than Israel. The United States is inseparable from Israeli power. 
This is the context of my situation with the University of Illinois. There's a semiotics of disputation at play here. Folks feel invested in the outcome of, of this situation because its implications inform the corporatization of academe and the erosion of democratic governing practices on campus. The images of Palestine in the American imagination facilitate this decline of democracy. The continued occupation of Native American lands means that the democracy never fulfilled its own self-image. The University of Illinois administration maligned Native America and Palestine simultaneously. It did so by again conferring normativity to the commonsensical exercise of US and Israeli state power. It requires a deeply civilized mind to accomplish all these things in so short a time without the faintest hint of self-awareness. Obliviousness, anyway, is how civility survives. The most consistent forms of violence in this world are the ones explained away as natural human behavior. There's nothing more natural than our godly responsibility to perpetually renew the purity of the American landscape. And thank you. <laughs> Thank you.